There's a saying that most people miss opportunities because when opportunity knocks, it comes dressed in overalls and looks like hard work. It looks a lot like Mike Rowe. It was the ultimate passion. You know, it was my dream. And I, it just fell in my lap that there was an opportunity, you know? And I just, and I was absolutely determined. I met Mike completely by accident after three wrong turns and a profanity-laden shouting match with Siri. But I guess three wrong turns make a right in this case. You see, Indiana is called the covered bridge capital of the world. That's according to Indiana and no one else. Who cares? Between 1820 and 1920, about 500 covered bridges were built in Indiana, and several dozen of those are concentrated in Park County. The idea behind covering the bridges was functional, not aesthetic. There was no such thing as treated wood in the 1800s, so it only made sense to put a roof over the fragile wooden frame. To see this terribly scenic drive, there's an absolutely horrible map offered online that becomes completely worthless once you get into Park County. This part of Indiana has not discovered cell phone data, and it's Amish country, so you can't just like go up to one of the farmers and ask to connect to his Wi-Fi. Lost, tired, and completely out of interest, I stumbled into Bridgeton and found this icon of Americana both the building and its owner. The Bridgeton Grist Mill has been turning grain into flowers here since 1870, making it the oldest continuously operated mill in the Midwest, according to Mike. He's the 14th owner. In the mid-90s, the mill was in severe disrepair and Mike was working in furniture making. He'd take the route home that gave him a glimpse of his big dream project, owning and restoring the massive rotting relic. Well, in 94, I sold almost a truckload of furniture to two ladies in a store. I thought, well, I'll drive by, see the old mill. Door was open. So I walked up on the porch, and there was a piece of paper nailed to the building, and somebody had written mill for sale. I thought, nah, there's no way. The asking price was $240,000, and hundreds of thousands more would be needed to repair it. His wife, Karen, was the first to hear about it, and probably the first to need a stiff drink after. But I come home and she said, uh, how'd you do? I said, those two ladies in that store bought almost every piece of furniture I had. And she said, oh, that's wonderful. And I said, yeah, and on the way home, I spent a quarter of a million dollars. And she said, what? The bank wanted $72,000 down at 13% interest, and their family home was held as collateral. Money aside, by all estimates, the building was far gone. It took eight months of begging and borrowing, but it was so bad, there's almost no glass in the windows, big holes in the roof. Termites ate it all up, the floors are like this. Mike didn't have all the money, and other offers were coming in to turn the place into something like a bed and breakfast, much to the horror of the elderly owner, Mildred, whose late husband had dedicated his life to turning that stone. Without a check from the bank, Mike made one last offer that could only be cashed against his word. I said, the only thing I can think of, Mildred, you give me half of it, we can match it, and I promise you I'm going to save that old mill, restore it, and carry on. So there went my woodwork here, out the window. I want this place. I don't care what it costs. And she said, Michael, I want you to have the mill because I know you're going to do good. Mildred, smart lady she was, would not give him the keys until he took a day-long crash course from the family on how to grind each of the flowers. Mind you, 24 hours prior, Mike was making furniture. Now, he was about to renovate a four-story mill, learn how to operate a 200-year-old spinning stone, oh, and be ready in two months for one of the Midwest's biggest events, the Covered Bridge Festival. No pressure. Oh, I scared to death. Over the coming years, there would be nightmare after nightmare. The first big disaster was the, the foundation collapsing. Uh, it wasn't a huge hole, it was 14 feet and it's like uh, 13 feet high. The big sandstone blocks, the biggest one was like 800 pounds, just fell out and just scared me to death. I thought the whole building was going to fall. Once the foundation was stable... We noticed all these bugs and uh, so I called up uh, the termite people or bug people and they came out. Oh, they were so excited. Every bug known to eat, bu eat, eat wood was there. We had powder post beetles, we had... Uh, carpenter ants, we had uh, termites. Minus thousands of dollars from the budget. 
All this with a persistent unwelcome from the public that even included a lawsuit. Change in very small towns is not always welcome. And we had some nasty articles written about us, and uh, and it just got it just got worse and worse. It was like a competition who could come up with the craziest ideas to complain about us. During renovation, the mill was repeatedly vandalized. Trying to repair the windows, um, single pane of glass. There's over 500 in the building, and uh, people were busting it out about as fast as I put it in. And then people were breaking in the place. Um, and so we put two befores over all the windows downstairs, two befores over the door at night. They were determined to stop me. That's motivation. You can't do this. We're going to stop you. I said, oh, really? And they probably, I probably worked 10 times harder because they were trying to stop me. Once Mike got the building stabilized, he still had to contend with the dam. It was overgrown and barely flowing. Uh, the dam was terrible shape. Um, and that, the dam creates falling water to spin your wheel because there's no mountains around here. So in order to restore the water power, I had to restore the dam. And I knew it was going to be beautiful. Cover bridge over a mill pond right above a waterfall. Wow, that was my big, one of my big goals. In 1997, the estimate for the work was $750,000. Well, Mike had no idea how to build a dam, but he did have friends with tools and guts. Together, they figured it out for a cool $50,000. And just as things were looking up for Mike and Karen, a man named Jesse Payne got out of jail on good behavior, got himself a can of gasoline, and set the covered bridge ablaze. Well, I was so devastated, I'm done. 10 years, all this trouble, all this aggravation, we're still making payments to the lawyers, mills for sale, I'm out of here. Mike was finished with the mill, but the mill wasn't finished with Mike. Neighbors started donating acres and acres of timber, supplies, and machines. An architect did the blueprints for free, and 17 months later, the bridge was rebuilt. That really restored my faith in people. Today, the grist mill is still a constant investment of repairs and improvements. In order to truly go back to hydroelectric, he has to restore the turbines and hopes to rebuild the collapse section to house them. We're talking repairs to the tune of $200,000 here. He wrote a book called 14 Miracles. It's his story and struggle at the mill. And he hopes and prays that one day the proceeds will raise enough to finally finish his dream. I've just come to believe that, that uh, you do good deeds, you move forward. And if you're an honorable person, things will happen. My theory here is uh, this is not a museum. This is not a reenactment. I'm running this mill. Maybe the next guy will make a museum out of it, but I'm not. I'm continuing to run this. I said, you know, you can read about history, you can watch it on TV, but if you want to visit it, you come here. This is history. Mike may spend the rest of his days keeping the mill alive, but Mike understands that while on paper he owns a piece of property, he doesn't really own the mill. He's a trusted steward of history, along a continuum of others who have all stood at that stone and considered the simple act of keeping it going to be their highest responsibility. Mike's story is all about charging ahead while staring down fear. Now I'm charging north, with plenty of fear, to a place that's been routinely ranked a murder capital and one of the worst cities to live in.